eat and it's uh, 2 p.m. So warmly welcome, Torsten, and, and you are free to start your presentation. Welcome. Yeah, thank you very much for having me for the first thing. And uh, thank you, Janne, for keeping this network together and making us meeting in these strange times in the world. Uh, so thank you very much for this. And uh, I'm using both my, my computer and my, my iPad. And if, if the, the picture removes, the, the, there's somebody who didn't listen to me when I said, don't call me at this time. So we will see what happens. So my name is Torsten Nilsson and I'm the deputy director of the Swedish Air Force Museum and I'm also working as a project leader uh, in the rebuilding of, of this part of the museum right now. So I come back to that and um, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, what's going I, I included some parts, sorry about that, Janne, but I just had to. Uh, what's going on at the Swedish Air Force Museum, uh, why we have the collections we have and the secret lives of our airplanes. Uh, and I will, of course, also talk about the Saab B-18 restoration, but uh, you get a little bit more, I would say. And uh, th this will not be so much about nuts and rivets, uh, it's it's more the history about navigating in our museum universe and uh, things we do which other museums don't do and uh, yeah that's basically the the history so what is going on at the swedish air force museum is the first thing and uh, here you see a picture of our museum building you see different years, 1984, it's the first part of the museum was built then. And um, and you can see different years when all the buildings were built. And um, since we started building this museum, we have had problems with the roof uh, and um, it's been leaking. We, we get water inside our buildings and we don't like water. So uh, our, um, our house owner decided to rebuild the roof and uh, we, we also are going to uh, the, the trusses of the roof, we, we have to reinforce them. So uh, what's going on? You see this is building 1984. This is the, the inside right now. Where are all our airplanes? They are gone. They are on the other side of the firewall here. And um, the, the work started this week in, in reinforcing the trusses in this part of the building. And um, it's going good, but it's scary moments because we have to turn off many, many of the, the fire alarms, parts of the fire alarm. So it's scary days all the time now at the museum uh, but we have to do this and it will end up good because in the spring of 2021 we will have a new roof over our building but uh, a new roof isn't all new things we have we also have a new museum director and directors they want to think new, they want to change things and uh, our new museum director is uh, Naomi Eriksson and uh, she came to the museum one and a half year ago and she's been listening to us. What kind of ideas do we have? How do we want to improve our museum? And this is what we plan for the next coming one and a half year. So Janne, when you come to the Swedish Air Force Museum next time, you have a battery powered car. So you will park at the charging station at our car park and charge your batteries while you go and see the, the uh, exhibitions and have a good lunch. And um, we, we also work with traffic safety around our museum because we have quite a lot of visitors and we have traffic and pedestrians mix which is not a good thing to do so we will also do a very 
good traffic dividing bit between cars and peoples. Uh, and outside the museum, we are building a playground. And then you ask, why do uh, Air Force Museum build a playground? Yes, this is, will be a very special playground. It will be a, a playground about military objects and uh, aviation. So we want to make the kids think about aviation even when they are small. Um, and they will have a, a landing strip, they will have small airplanes, and but also the, the, the maintenance uh, cars for uh, keeping an uh, airfield up and running. Um, and this playground, if everything works out good, we will open it in uh, May 2021. Further on, we, we hope this is just hope, but it's uh, a very, we will make it, I think so. We will want to build a new restaurant and the restaurant is uh, in between our office and, and the exhibition hall. So we will connect the buildings together. And we are also rebuilding the science center because it's closed now when we weld the trusses. And uh, the, the, the uh, Science Center is about learning why th things fly and get interested in, in aviation. And we will build a new exhibition 35 meters uh, on the wide and 120 meters long. And that's the exhibition about everything from the early days to when the jet engines came. So it will be from 1912 to 1950 something. And the exhibition, it will take some time and we will be finished with the exhibition in the spring 2022. So maybe we could have a conference about building exhibition, exhibitions in the future. Uh, and one lovely thing with, with reinforcing the, the roofs is that we will be able to sprinkle the, the whole exhibition halls. And that's something I've been dreaming about so many years. And, and now I think we will manage. It's, it's always what you want to do and how much money you have. But you know that story. And finally, uh, to all our Finnish friends then, we will... Uh, exhibit our Futuro house uh, outside the museum uh, and it will be possible to see from the from the spring next year and everybody starts wondering what, what is the Futuro house yeah, well this is a Futuro house uh, it was uh, a Finnish architect who wrote this uh, as a summer cabin of course, you were very rich if you bought one and you could use a helicopter to move it out in, in the fields where you wanted to stay this summer. And uh, the Swedish Air Force bought three of these uh, and they put them on, on concrete. Uh, so it, it's like a tower, 10 meters high, something. And um, they placed them at the shooting ranges for the airplanes and uh, the staff was sitting inside the Futura house watching how, how the uh, airplanes hit the targets. So this one will be on display from next spring. So that's a little bit of our future plans this next one and a half year and it will be exciting days. Now I move on to our collections. I say like this, if you don't want to know your collections, you have to know your museum history. And I will talk about the museum history and our collections at the same time. Uh, we have a quite big uh, collection. We have photos, we have museum objects, spare parts, books and the library and the archive. And uh, we also have 243 airplanes. And, and uh, it's a reasonable question, why do we have 243 airplanes and 44 helicopters? And, and the, the, the answer is pretty simple. It's about laws and reg regulation. 
uh, every airplane that is considered a, 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 as war material can only in Sweden it can only have three three uh, owners: the manufacturer, the user, or the state museum. And the Air Force isn't interested in historical airplanes. They want the new things and the manufacturers, they don't build their museums, so it's up to us. And that's why we have a very big collection of airplanes and helicopters. And uh, if you write all their names, it looks, looks like this. And it's colorful and it's a lot of text and you can't read this and don't do it. But look at the colors, uh, the, the black and the blue colors. That's the, the airplanes we only have one of. The red ones and the green ones are the ones we have a lot of. And um, the green, we have a common field in these uh, teams, don't we? So you can all start thinking about why is the uh, Saab Safir green. So I want some suggestions there. Please tell me why I'm painting it green. I will tell you later, of course, but uh, and also the, the, the red color, no, the blue color, sorry, the blue color is something I'm very proud of because th they are the world unique airplanes uh, which only exists, exist, exist in, in one. one. Uh, and that's the ones we are most proud of, I would say. So 243 airplanes, wow. <laughs> Uh, and this is uh, the, the last helicopter who came to our our collection. It's uh, in 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 Sweden we have a pretty cool names on them. This is called uh, Helicopter Ten B, and it's a Super Puma. And uh, we it came to our collection about three years ago. Uh, most of these uh, helicopters, uh, Super Pumas, were uh, used as rescue helicopters at the air bases. But uh, uh, since Glasnost and when the wall came down, it was decided that um, Sweden would take part in, in um, conflicts in other parts of the world. And three of these Super Pumas were made for the Afghanistan conflict and uh, served there for most a year, I think, something. And um, after, after that, they came, two of them came to our museum. And we have the helicopter division in Sweden. They are located at the same place as our museum. And we have, of course, a lot, lot of uh, uh, we talk with them quite a lot and they promised us one good thing and the, 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 the man in charge said to me, you don't, you don't have to be afraid because you will have to wait 10 to 15 years before you get the, the next helicopter. And we're pretty glad about that because um, like you know, in aviation museums, um, roof over your things is always the most important things and we lack some roofs, roofs now we need more roofs so that was the last helicopter and this is uh, uh, the um, state of the art museum object because this thing has never been touched uh, after it came to the museum it went went directly from service and into our, our museum uh, the latest is a uh, Gripen 39B, the, the double seater. And if the helicopter was uh, the uh, state of the art museum object, uh, I'm sorry, but I can't say the same thing about this airplane. Uh, th this airplane is probably more about the story how military aircrafts work today you reuse a lot of parts in your aircraft. So this one, when it came to uh, to our museum, it didn't land at, at the airfield next to the, the Air Force Museum. It landed on the other airfield in Linköping, the Saab field. And uh, 
was parked in a hangar and they removed everything they want to reuse on, on from this aircraft. So the, the seats went away, the head up display, the joysticks, the engine and a lot of different things. And uh, because uh, a, a seat in a Gripen is very valuable, so, so they couldn't give them to us at this point. Uh, but like I said, this is the story of how aviation, military aviation works today. And um, we will see if we will um, put, put the missing parts in place or if we will keep it like this. That's an, uh, a question we will ask ourselves in the future. And like you know, guys, it's soon will be Christmas, so this is the Christmas wish for Swedish Air Force Museum. This is uh, the first TP-84 Hercules uh, that came to Sweden in the 1960s. And um, really like this present. at the Marshall uh, workshop where, where they have service for all the Hercules airplanes in Europe. Uh, and it's uh, like you see, it's, it's, it's mostly it's not kept inside, it's kept outside, outside the, the, the manager of the Marshall workshop and he's very angry with the Swedish Air Force. Um, he wants it removed immediately. And um, yeah, you know the times now, people can travel, it's not so easy to remove an airplane. Uh, but hopefully we will get uh, th this, a part of this airplane back to Sweden. And what we are hoping for is the, the nose section from, from behind the, the first window, because uh, the, re the re rest of it is very cannibalized. Uh, all the engines are removed and and m many spare parts are removed as well. And um, but if we got the, um, the the nose section, we could tell the the story about this specific aircraft, which have served all around the world. And um, then we can wait 10, 15, 20 years, and then maybe one of the other Hercules in in Sweden will can go to our museum, and by that time. We have built a new magnificent roof where we can keep it. So that's what we want for Christmas. And this is the, the future. What we think about will happen at objects coming to our museum. The, the yellow one top and the bottom left is uh, Mitsubishi MU, MU2. And um, we will probably get one of those just in the beginning of next year. It's a target tower uh, used for target practicing and um, it will be a good piece in, in our exhibition because the, the um, Target towing has been, Saab has been doing the target towing. You can see their logo on the fin, but uh, today it's going back to the military. So they will s use the target tugs from, from our airfield at, at Malm and in Linköping. And uh, as you can see, we have to build more roof. And that's what I say to my boss every day. We have to build more roof. And if you, if you say it, Many, many times it can be true in the end. And this is why the Saab Safir was green. We said that there's crazy, crazy things you do on, on an on a aviation museum. You celebrate things. And this was um, the celebration of the Saab Safir, 75 years. Uh, and we, we could, can, couldn't meet when we had the celebration, so so we live broadcasted the celebration from so from the Air Force Museum and uh, 
we also recorded the, the celebration, so all, all the speeches will be on, on YouTube or are at YouTube now. So, but it's in Swedish, so it's not so easy for you guys to, to take. So, I think I move on to um, how to know your museum and how to know your collection. Um, the first army airplane in Sweden was bought in 1912, and, and I'll come back to that figure. And in 1926, the Swedish Air Force was founded. Um, really back in these days, the, the military started collect, collecting things. And, and um, it's just because these people people made good decisions. We have the lovely collection we have. Uh, and in 1940 something, this collection got its name. It's called Malmen Collection. Malmen is the place where we are located. Uh, and uh, we have a voluntary organization uh, called Östergötlands uh, Flying Hi History society and their their biggest aim was to build a air force museum and in 1977 they succeeded and the, the swedish air force museum was founded it's a st state museum we get get our foundings from the culture department and at that time in 1977 we were located in a crappy barn in ryd uh, it was wet, it was cold, but it was at least a roof. And since 1984, we've been on this location, today's site. Um, and um, since then, we're building and building, and we're up to what we are now. And at 2010, just mentioning, we were the Museum of the Year in Sweden. And of course, after all this refurbishment, in our museum, we, we, we're aiming for the prize again, so help us. It's not of, often aviation museums get rewards in Sweden. But back to the old days. Um, th this picture is mostly about the uh, the crash of the of Carl Silov. He was the, the first pilot in Sweden who died. Uh, and um, but for me, it's also about the thing in the background, the Newport 4G. Because this airplane was bought in 1912 and already after three years, they keep it in a in a barn with a wreckage. And um, you must say that from this day, 1950, 15 we started some sort of collecting of objects because this airplane is now in our exhibition and it's quite funny it's it flew 1966 ish uh, it would never happen today i'm sure uh, but it was when the air f it was some sort of celebration when the air force really wanted show off so they completely stripped it down and rebuilt it again and um, and actually flew it <laughs> would never happen today uh, this is another of our pretty old aircrafts which mysterically has survived to present days uh, the, the black and white picture is from the Malmen collection. It's somewhere about 1945-ish. Yeah. And uh, you can see the airplane, it's marked 951, and it's a Maki M7 a flying boat. And um, it's pretty funny. It's marked 951 because when it shows up on, on the next picture, the, the color picture is marked 945 and uh, that's in our first exhibition it's not is somewhere 1980 after 1984 and after that we, we sent it to a restoration and when it came back it's 951 again and 
what has been going on. Yeah, we'll think the museum is about telling stories. It's about it's also about museums can be political. You can use museums as a political statement of what you want to say. And uh, it can be big politics and it can be just average politics. And I would say in this case, 945 had a more cool history or something. So maybe they just wanted to tell this more, a little bit cooler history about the 945, which flew to Finland and back. And uh, so they changed it a little bit. And now we changed it back. And that's uh, something we often do at our museum these present days. We kind of change mistakes back to something that shouldn't have been done. And also on this black and white picture, I re really lo love the, the small boy with, with a machine gun in, in the Fokker. I, I don't know who he is, but I re would really like to know. <laughs> he looks kind of cool. Uh, this is uh, a picture I really love. Uh, it's our collection. It's somewhere taken somewhere in 1946 something. And the line lineup is just amazing. It's the Tiger Schwalbe, the Gloucester Gladiator, the Hawker Heart and the Regiane RE2000. And if you look at these aircrafts, none of them looks as it looks in our exhibitions today. The Tiger Swalb, the, the one to the left, uh, it has new, at least it, it, it's, um, it's and the color is, um, I can't remember the color, shit. Uh, you see the color on the, on the, <laughs> on the color picture down below, but when it has at least uh, it's been renumbered. Re so at our exhibition today, it's number 101, but you can see on the black and white picture, it's 102. The, the Gloucester Gladiator is totally repainted in, in, in Finnish markings and from the F-19 and the Winter War. Uh, this is the same aircraft, but it, and it came back to Sweden. It served during the Second World War and Sometime in the 1940s, it was repainted back to the Finnish markings. And it's the same with, with the next one, the Hawker Heart. It's, it, it's also painted in Finnish colors uh, from F-19. Um, but it never went there. Yeah, so it's just another way of trying to tell a history with something you have in your collections. But I really love this picture. It tells a, little, a lot about our collections. This one is uh, our P-51 Mustang, and um, it came to Sweden in the end of the Second World War. And um, it came in, in April 1945. And the story when it came to Stockholm is just amazing. Uh, the, the most skilled American pilots were the one who were chosen to fly these ones to Sweden. And um, imagine them, 16 airplanes uh, cruising around Stockholm, waiting to land and finally realizing, wow, there's a lot of bridges here. Let's try to fly under them. So these 16 aircrafts, they, they flew under every bridge they could find in Stockholm, which was high enough to fly under. Uh, and uh, they really scared the, the, the Stockholm people uh, when they arrived. And it served in Sweden for a couple of years until the jet age came. And um, after that, it was uh, sold to Israel. And um, after some years, the Air Force succeeded to get this one back to, to Sweden and uh, they restored it like this. And uh, it's a lot of wrong things, wrongdoings on this one. So actually, this is the one we have in our workshop today, and we're trying to make it back into 1952 in Sweden. 
uh, and we have and it's our museum staff which are doing this work and this the picture is from our workshop now um, we are doing two two american airplanes in our workshop at the same time it's the mustang and the um, groom and goose and the, the groom and goose is another fu funny story it's it's uh, something we learned a lot is don't and listen carefully now don't ever buy a, a airplane in caribbean and and store it for 30 years because aluminium and salt water yeah you know it don't, doesn't mix uh, so it's a lot of work to do with this machine and um, why are we restoring this one uh, there was only one serving in the swedish air force and it crashed in 1962 uh, but we will rebuild this one to look like the one who served in the Swedish Air Force and we will tell this and we do it because we want to tell the story about uh, rescuing people in, in, the, in the mountains in Sweden. Uh, so it's because we want to tell the story we do this job. And the Mustang we do because we want to tell the correct history. So now over to the, what I'm supposed to talk about. Sorry about this. And it's the, the B18 project. And, but, but I think you have to have the context about our museum and, and the years to, to fully understand this project. And it's a story about the, the Saab B18B, the Red David. The serial number is 18172. It's a twin engine. Uh, medium heavy bomb and kind of look like the Hampton. Uh, it's constru constructed and built in, in Sweden by Saab. But the story begins in 1936 uh, when uh, the Air Force was the big winner in, in the Swedish parliament. Uh, uh, they got a lot of money uh, and uh, the decision, decision meant that the Air Force would establish a fighter wing and four bomber wings the the um, tactics at that time was to bomb the enemy airfields before they could bomb you uh, so it was about air base control and it was pretty much what they were talking about in the rest of the europe at that time as well uh, and the dec decision was to build uh, build our own airplanes but as you know it takes time to build an air force so when the war broke out, uh, the, the Swedish Air Force looked like this. Uh, we had 40, 40 heavy bombers, uh, Junkers 86. We had 30 light bombers. It was the um, the Hawker. No, no, the word is disappearing. We got back. We'll get back to that. And we have 50 fighters, and they were all stationed around Stockholm. It was lost the gladiators and 50 reconnaissance aircrafts, and it was mostly these Hansa aircrafts, like the one you have in Finland. So 180 airplanes in total was what was in Sweden when the war broke out. And the, the, the decision was to build our own bombers. So th this is the first product of, of Saab. It's, it's the light bomber, the Saab B-17. A single engine, a crew of two, two. And um, the heavy bombers, they were all stationed in the, the F1 wing in Westeros. It's west of, of Stockholm. And uh, they use this Junkers 86 aircrafts. And uh, during the war, uh, Saab and the Air Force decided that they wanted th this medium heavy bomber, a twin engine, uh, and it was the, the, the Saab B-18. Uh, and the de delivery of this airplane started in 1944. Uh, the first six, uh, first batch was uh, with twin wasp engines, and after that they used Daimler Benz DB605 engines, uh, and a total amount of 200, 245 air aircrafts were built. 
And uh, they were built at Saab in Linköping, and this is from the underground factory in, in, in Linköping. And as you can see, it's the, the B18B series built here with the Daimler-Benz engines. Uh, we don't know much about this particular airplane and the, and the history, the war service. But it was stationed in, in Halmstad uh, at the airfield at F-14 in Halmstad. And Halmstad is in south of Sweden, southwest, you can say. Uh, but after the, the war, uh, the last flight was supposed to go from Halmstad over Westeros and up to, to the northern parts of, of Sweden. Uh, they, they stopped for a refueling in Westeros. Uh, but they had to wait, uh, wait there for better weather. And you have to remember this is winter time, so it can be quite foggy quite snowy in Sweden. Uh, and what were they go going to do up in northern Sweden? Yes, they were try try going to exercise bomb bomb bombings. And um, they, they stayed in, in Westeros for three days, waiting for better weather. But in, in the morning, the 10th of February, they started from Westeros. Uh, the commander, he started 30 minutes before the rest of the airplanes and uh, they had a warning about snow and fog from the west. Uh, and um, the first airplane, which started 30 minutes before the others, made it to, to Luleå, where the airfield is. But the rest of the ones, eight aircrafts, they met snow and fog in, in in Piteå at the top of Sweden, uh, a, a white wall, and they, and they had to turn south. And uh, you have to rem remember at that time in Sweden, there wasn't that much uh, airfields. So they, they headed for um, Sundsvall, which was the closest uh, airfield in for them. Uh, but they, they couldn't reach it, so they had to emerge emergency land where, wherever they could. So eight aircrafts went down. And they, they were scattered by snow and, snow and fog. Uh, in these airplanes, you can see on the pictures, everybody survived. But as you maybe you remember, it was nine airplanes. So one is still missing and uh, they flew two, two and two, and, and you can see the, the, the dots. This one is a B-3 bomber, which had engineers and, and ground staff with them. This is two of the aircraft flying together. The one to the right here is the one who we have in our collection today. Uh, these are the two other ones flew together. And this one, two ones flew together. And this one is a pair with a question mark. And uh, nobody has been able to find this airplane. It's just vanished from, from, from Earth and uh, is still missing. And this is a mystery we try to solve, but we haven't been able to do it. And uh, the reason must be water. Uh, it must be buried uh, under the sea or, or, the, or the, the river, which is called Ongerman Elven. Uh, and it's now and then going on the discussions that we really should find this aircraft. Uh, back to the one at our museum. It's this one. It's um, it crash landed outside the, the, the harbor of the city of Hennesan. And um, just the day before, it crash landed. The, the icebreaker had been removing the ice, so so um, ships could get into the harbor. And tough luck, they ended up just where the the icebreaker had done its work. So it started to sink, but it didn't didn't go go entirely down. So the day after, they, they tried to salvage the, the wreck with the icebreaker and um, quite 
um, forceful trying to <laughs> get it up on the ship, uh, but it didn't work. Uh, and they they lost it and it crashed down to to the ice once again, uh, and they lost the tail. And this is the situation the day after. You can see it; it's slowly sinking down. And yeah, well, everybody realized we, we won't make this, so it will sink. And it did. And that was the end of the, of, uh, the story about when the airplanes crashed. And the, this, is the, this picture is the story about what happened in Sweden when the jet age came. Yeah, we scrapped mostly everything. So this is a list of everybody, every airplane type we, we scrapped or sold to other countries. It's a, an amazing list. <laughs> And of course, they had a lot of target practicing as well. So most it all went to scrap. Uh, but uh, of course, they that gives us a challenge uh, today uh, or in the 1970s to to get some of these missing airplanes back. Uh, the B-5, the Douglas Northrop one. One is go going to be re rebuilt as a st on static display in Sweden. The, the, the Hansa is the only one, we, nearly only, the only one we don't have. Uh, the B B18 is in our museum. The G21R is in our museum. We have a replica of the Caproni. The Mosquito, we have a, a small part of a fin, and that's all. <laughs> uh, the Mustang, you saw, we have been able to rebuild the Spitfire and the Venom as well. So uh, what happened was that in the 1970s they started a search for the B-18 at the crash site. Two of them, no, four of them was buried underwater and the, uh, after a while during divings in the Hennesand Harbor, they were able to locate the wreck in, in, in 1978. And remember, that's the year after our museum was founded as a state museum. And most of this work was done by the, by the Air Force and aviation, aviation enthusiasts. And um, this is a lovely sonar picture from 1978 uh, showing the, the wreck on, on the bottom of the sea. And it looked like this. Uh, the tail section was lost. Uh, I would say parts of the wings was lost as well. The depth was 29 meters. Uh, so the first step to bring it up was to tip it down uh, to the bottom of, of the seafloor. And after that, they was they were able to get it up on on the on the case in Hannes Sand. It was washed and it was treated with dinitrol. Um, but remember, this is 1978, so maybe it wasn't done the way we should have done it today. And um, after that. The, the talk started about what to do with it. Should we display just the salvage parts or the whole body without some plates or maybe a fully restored external body? Uh, and this is the only B-18 aircraft in the world, so they decided to rebuild the, the, the fully restored external body. And um, this is one way to do it. Uh, we have the other way to do it in our basement at the Air Force Museum. Uh, the DC-3 signal intelligence aircraft, which was shut down in 1952. It's conservated and treated, but uh, it's still on display at roughly the same position as it was lying on the bottom of the sea. Uh, this part, this way of showing an, our aircraft, an aircraft is, is not a cheap way of showing an aircraft because you have to do a lot of treatment, you have to build a, a, a 
protection around it. You you have to keep it environmentally safe. Uh, uh, so I think this is once in a lifetime in Sweden we will do something like this. Uh, I'm not saying that the other way is cheap either. Come back to that. Um, but uh, the work started and uh, the Swedish Air Force Museum wasn't in any way involved in this. Yeah, well, maybe some phone calls, some discussions, some trying to find spare parts, but uh, the, the work was done on, on another site. It was do done mostly at the airfield at Malmö and at, at the Saab factory. Uh, but it was made by the same per people who built this aircraft many years ago. So they had served at the uh, production line at Saab and they could, I would say they were the most skilled person to rebuild the BA team, the ones who built it a couple of years ago. And they were mo most men, but there was one woman taking part and it's, it's a quite funny history because the uh, the woman who who worked with all the fabric on all the the, the built airplanes the, the b-18s uh, and sadly i don't remember her name now but i i will i have it so don't, don't worry but um she made the fabric on all the the built airplanes and she also made the fabric on this particular museum aircraft. So that's, uh, it's kind of cool, I would say. And this was the outcome in 1989-ish, when it came to our museum. Uh, it was the ex exterior part rebuilt. And like in many other restoration, uh, rebuilding stories, they had found the wheels at a farmer. Uh, they had a cr crappy place where they, they still stayed by during, during this restoration work. Uh, they had to rebuild a lot and uh, somewhere in nine, oh, I think I spared that. We come back to that. Um, and this is some pictures from the, the recent work at the museum. And like, as you see, they started to re rebuilding the interior as well. Uh, I'll go to that as the timeline. Uh, it, it crash landed in 1946. Came up from the sea, 78, 79, the work began at, at Malmö and, and Saab. And then our museum was two years old. Um, in 89, it came to our museum when we had built the, the, the second uh, exhibition hall. And uh, some time after that, somebody made the decision to be, rebuild the interior as well. Uh, and it's it's quite amazing to to make that decision to rebuild the the interior as well, and uh, I'm very glad for that because they done a marvelous job. And um, years went by, and last year, 2019, just a person came to my office and said, "Well, Torsten, we're finished now. We need something else to do." And the, the question they hate most of all is when I ask, when are you going to be finished, guys? Uh, because they never know. But now they are finished and they, um, I would say this is a story of a 30 year old restoration work, uh, which mostly has passed outside our museum radar because it's, it's the volunteers that has done this work. And uh, I would say, the museum staff, at least the museum staff of today, has not been part of this project, which I find kind of sad. Um, and I don't really have a good answer why we haven't been involved in it, uh, because it's an amazing project and uh, I'm so glad they made it. Uh, and what made all this 
restoration work possible? Yes, of course, volunteers. And they spend a lot of time during 30 years. In average, they, they give us 5,000 hours a year on, a, on a yearly basis and take that 30, 30 years then. Uh, of course, you need a workshop with tools and you need, need no, no knowledge. That's the trickiest word in English. You should use, change that to something else. Um, and this work was done by the people who built the airplane uh, at, the, at the assembly line. So they had skills and they had, we, we spent a lot of time. We spent a lot of money. And maybe most important, seeing op opportunities, not problems, uh, and having a vision. And the, the vision for this project was to being, be able to show a B-18, a Saab B-18, because mm, it's the only one in the world. And I think to finish this, I think they have done a marvelous job and I'm so proud of them. And I, if it wasn't Corona, I would hug them all. So thank you very much for having me.